Oh, I've gone black. Oh, there you are. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> it, it is evening, Ross. Well done. Welcome to a very special edition of Face to Face. And it is, and now it's my great honour to uh, welcome a man that, uh, the former frontman of a band that I admire greatly, um, Mr. Paul Roberts. Paul, thanks for joining me. You're absolutely welcome, Ross. The money came through, so I'm here. <laughs> Don't say that. Um, <laughs> that was a joke, viewers. So, uh, yeah, how did you actually get into music? Uh, I think my father's influence. Uh, yeah, he was always playing music. He introduced me to the Beatles. He introduced me to Count Basie, to Duke Ellington, to uh, Sarah Vaughan, to Frank Sinatra, to... Wow. And I introduced him in return to Pink Floyd and Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> which is it's quite a payoff, but he was cool. Um, yeah, I think that's what it was. Uh, he bought us a few instruments. I, I, I must say he bought us a Beatles guitar and a paper drum kit. And that was that, really. I, don't, I think it was his fault that I've ended up like this. So um, I've, I actually read in another interview that... Um, you said you were the ringleader for uh, most of the party. So, uh, have you got any stories that you can share? A ringleader for most of the what? So I missed that word. Uh, for most of like the party in and. Okay, someone must have said that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I kind of yeah, I, I used <laughs> get myself in trouble. Uh, yeah, I used to be pretty into that. Uh, I did used to, I think I, my, my times of, were at 10 past two in the afternoon to half past five in the very early morning. And uh, pretty much most people used to go to bed on the bus, except a couple of us. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've always been like that, really. I'm, tr I'm trying to quieten down a bit now. It wasn't like the shows got in the way or anything. It was just like, <laughs> OK, <laughs> we're done now. Let's go. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I quite like bringing people together. That's 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 the thing. So, yeah. Um, there are stories. Ah, oh my God, lots of naked in the halls of some hotel. I can't even remember what it was. I couldn't get back in the fire door. I used to go around and bring some of the goodies from the shows and make sure everybody stayed awake by dropping things off at their door. <laughs> uh, oh my God, there are many, many, many things. I do remember getting into um, trouble the same way in the Eurostar and finding myself locked out of it in some hideous corridor and I only had my pants on, so that wasn't great. It's not, it's not really a party thing, but I couldn't get back in and I couldn't get them to see me through the porthole of the door and I'm going, I'm here, don't go without me. So, uh, yeah, there's a hundred more stories. I'll, I'll probably pop one in later when I when it surfaces. There's a couple of really tasty ones. So, so what's your favourite show or venue you played? Oh, Barrowlands. No hesitation. That's in that's a Glasgow gig. I mean, that is. Uh, uh, yeah, we had our moments there. That's a very very um, special place. I mean, in the, in the entire world I've played, that's probably the greatest audience, most enthusiasm, most power. Um, yeah, and I like that sort of thing. Um, so what's, what was the uh, writing process? Um, well, that was kind of tricky, really. Um, I think when I joined the band, I think obviously they'd been writing a long time. I think they wanted, they were, you know, we all look for new input when we do something new. Um, and so I was quite prolific. I could write, but then there is a pecking order as well. So I kind of paid respect to that because I didn't want to barge my way in. And I, I, I don't know if that's the right or wrong way to go about it. Um, but. I would submit material and see where we got with that. Sometimes, you know, you 
sometimes people don't want to just play a tune that you've written. They want to try their hand at it and see if they can do something with it. But ultimately, yeah, a lot of that stuff ends up um, just being played and recorded. So, uh, so we shared everything we did, which was a great compliment to to, to my former colleagues. Um, but yes, that that was kind of one of the reasons I, I moved on because I I wasn't fulfilled as a writer. So, which you'll probably ask me later. Yeah, you, you've actually kind of preempted my next question. <laughs> I was actually going to ask you if, if you're okay to talk about. Um, the split. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I walked away from it because I didn't feel that uh, I was going to progress any further as a as, as a part of the writing setup. Um, and I, I had a lot of ideas and a lot of things I wanted to do, and I was quite prepared to kind of um, put myself into poverty for it, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's the way it goes. I, I think it was getting more difficult for me to sustain my my position in the band. You know, I did my best when they were not confident of writing or they were out of ideas. But sometimes um, I think if you've been in a scenario like that, you probably want to gain control over it more. So. I guess each party was guilty of that, and you know, but that's a that's the way it goes. That's life. Um, some people want to keep something precious and maintain that vibe or whatever, or you know, someone like me wants to just. I, I wanted to progress. I wanted to write different things, and yeah. So, I, oh, sorry, did I? Uh, um, so talk, uh, apparently you've got uh, new music coming out. Um, tell me a little bit about Back to Front. Uh, back to Front, Back to Black. Is that is that another? What have you got in front of you? I'm not sure. Back to Front. Sorry, sir. Is that what you've got there, Ross? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, um, I saw that. Um, I'm hoping it. I hope I've, I haven't just embarrassed myself here. But <laughs> we've got a Liverpool T-shirt on. Let's face it. There was a CD called Back to Front. Yeah, I, th I think it was. I'm not sure. There were. A, to be honest with you, I, I've, I've put out my own product, but there are companies. Someone has uh, been been um, compiling records of my music. So it. I think that's right. I, I think I've seen that. Sorry, I, I was immediately thinking you were going to ask me something else. So that's what threw me down that line. But yes, it's probably a selection of some track. You name the tracks and I'm with you. <laughs> God, you scared me. Um, <laughs> OK, that kind of leads nicely. Um, I was, was going to ask if anything, anything funny or not planned ever happened. Oh my lord! Yeah, funny. Uh, like we were gigging in Ventura in a huge uh, old theatre, and some drunken Americans turned the power off from the outside of the gig. And like, I mean, they had the power to a show outside. You know, you can't believe that. You think, well, well I think, yeah. You know, when you built this place, where did you put the light switches? They're inside, right? So why didn't you bring the power box inside as well? And then my manager, our manager, got into an altercation with them. And it was quite funny because I, I can, I'll, I'll tell you this story. Um, because the police rocked up because something was happening. And the kids, I think the management, obviously, of the theatre called the police. They came very quickly. My manager was out there and blah, blah, blah. What do you think you're doing? Et cetera, expletive, et cetera. And um, I think one of the Americans said... Um, one of the kids said, oh, something, 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 you English poof. And my manager turned around and just said, oh, no, you Australian poof. That's what he called him. Uh, and he's, you might have to edit this. And he said, I'm not Australian and I'm not a poof. And as he said the word poof, he um, landed uh, an uppercut 
on the chap. And the police said, I'm going to have to arrest you, sir. <laughs> so that was quite funny. But um, hey, all in the day's work. Uh, uh, right, OK. <laughs> you weren't expecting that one, were you? On that, on that buff show. <laughs> <laughs> so you may have already asked, answered this, but who were your inspirations um, when you first started in music? Well, I was a big fan of not trying to be anybody else. Sadly, because I look a little bit like Bowie and I sound a bit like him because I'm a sort of baritone tenor. Uh, and I look like him because I'm slight and I've got his kind of look, whatever. Um, I was kind of tarred with a bit of that, which was never my intention. But my influence is as a songwriter or as a lyricist or as a musician. So there's kind of a bit of everything in there. So Hendrix, uh, guitar wise, Hendrix, Pete Townsend, uh, style wise, uh, Roxy Music, Bowie, um, lyrically, uh, I always want, I'd never wanted the things to be obvious. I wanted to be ambiguous. So I guess you could say there's a bit of Bowie in there, but then, you know, loads of people write ambiguous lyrics. I don't try to write anything that goes, I am him and she are he or whatever. So uh, there's a trick to it sometimes. And sometimes it's quite basic, but uh, it depends on the subject. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, I guess they, you know, obviously Lou Reed, um, the Beatles to a certain extent, but that was not my era. I so I do appreciate them, but yeah, I mean, um, wasn't a big fan of the Stones, except for a period of time where they had Let It Bleed. There were certain songs that I absolutely thought were brilliant. But there was a lot of music there, Ross. You know, there's a lot of stuff that you take in that you're probably not aware of, of doing, you know, so. So, um, can we talk a bit about your charity work? How did you get involved in that? Oh, my father, he died of prostate cancer when in 2000. So he was sick for a year before that, and I got quite heavily involved when he died. Um, and I toured Britain with a load of boxes, and I took what would what what became the new guitarist singer of the Stranglers around, which uh, all at once gave him an introduction, sort of face to face with some fans, and also helped me go around and uh, deliver the message of prostate cancer, really. Um, so I was, we were playing to people and I was getting told that they'd never heard of some of the things that I was telling them. So it kind of makes you want to do it even more. Uh, so we had full houses and we collected money. We took that back to prostate cancer in London. We then, I got, then got invited to a place in Warwick University, uh, the John Van Geese Centre, um, which had like about an eight million pound grant from the banana people. There you go. And um, yeah, I was invited there and to look at all their computers and whatever scientific instruments, ooh, yeah, which I had no idea of, but it's very close to my heart. I, I did write a song for my dad about it. I tried to get Radio 2 to play it, but unfortunately, because they are driven, I financially, something like that doesn't get looked at which is quite unfortunate and that was going back obviously now nearly 23 years and within 10 years everybody was climbing on this thing you know and you go you know better late than never really but um and then I got involved in slogans and I I did advise them that they, their slogans were too dark so that was one thing they, they needed to be a bit more lighter about what they were trying to get across. So men paid attention to it. You know, it was really important to me that men um, looked after themselves. So. Okay. Um, okay. Um, another question here. Uh, how has how has the music business changed since uh, the days of the Stranglers? Well, I guess what you're doing is something similar or akin to how it used to be. You would work your way around the world using small networks. And eventually, of course, they join up, you know. Or, and if they don't, you've got small pockets of people all over the place that 
um, listen to you. So back then you did gigs and you did your best to get on the radio. But like I say, you know, it's, it's just, I'm sure you understand the idiosyncrasies of major radio and plugging and so on and so forth. So really you built an audience and that then made, created a demand. Whereas now, I think people claim there are bands that come off the internet. Well, I don't, I don't know if I, if I buy that so much. I buy it more now than I did when the Arctic Monkeys were born, for example. So I don't, I did, I couldn't see then that there was a band that was on the internet that they gave this big deal to because they're great bands, you know, the great writers and all the rest of it. But I think it, it was named as a band that came off the internet. I, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected, but I was told, oh, you know, get a YouTube account. You have to have so many hits on it. And, and it's kind of like, well, pfft. OK, I'd rather go out and play music, you know, and, and sit there and make a video and put it online and try to get people to look at it. That's the difference, I think. I think the marketplace is flooded. I think. I think there are certain stations that try to maintain the status quo, like I could say that music musically they sound the same as they did when I was a kid, which is it was quite a long time ago, you know. So there are some stations, for in my mind, like, for example, Radio 2, they will just maintain that status quo. It's not. Um, yeah. So we have one, one final question from someone who calls themselves Core Brow Obels. Calls um, themselves what? Core Brow Obels. I think that's how you say it. But, um, he says during the instrumental parts of Golden Brown, yeah. do you consider it six eight followed by a seven eight to account for the extra bait, or three four followed by a four four? Uh, the body of the song is a waltz. Okay, yeah. Well, it's a, it's three bars of three and one of four, and I can't remember what Jet used to call it out as, uh, but it's. Yes, I would say it was seven. Uh, what did you give me on offer there? <laughs> seven, eight, eight, eight. No. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, six, eight, six, eight, followed by seven, eight. Yeah, that's probably more like it. I think that's probably more like it. I mean, I'm not a great technician. So, you know, but it's definitely three of three, one of four, as is written. But I would probably go with you and say six, eight, seven, eight. I wouldn't say it was five, four. Cause it, <laughs> but just, to, just thought I'd throw that in to confuse everybody there. Uh, so what's, uh, what's on the horizon for Paul Robertson? Well, uh, probably a little bit more debt this year, um, a little bit more waste milk, uh, some holidaying, some work. I'm working on this album. It's uh, called 2022. Um, it's, I'm working on it as we speak. Um, I'm trying to get it finished by September. That's my main study at the moment. That's my main focus. Uh, trying to get in the sea as often as I can, do a little bit of um, sponge boarding. Um, and going to Australia to see my family, uh, where I'll probably mix this album. So, um, okay, you you mentioned something there that um, I'm going to bring up now. Uh, your theatre work. Okay. If uh, if you've got a favourite um, like uh, play that you've done, have I got a a, a a particular thing I like that I've done is that what you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I did a, a, a I did a, a, a thing um, about Ovid. Uh, it he was part. He was um someone. It was in a, it was it was a play based in the Roman Empire, and I did. Um, I can't remember how long I did with that, um, and I really thoroughly enjoyed doing that. It was pure. A lot of script, and I did it with Adele Anderson from Fascinating Aida. So that's a pretty 
well-known act. They're really great. They, I mean, they got back together some years ago and started touring again. I don't know if they split up, but that was, a, it was called Ovid, uh, uh, Ovid and the, the Art of Love. I keep wanting to say COVID. Uh, Ovid and the, the Art of Love. Um, we did it on a place called Battersea Barge, which is sort of fringe theatre. Um, but then I wrote other stuff. When I left the Stranglers, I did a theatre show for 54 nights, which became a sellout. It was a sellout show. It was off West End, but it was more of a musical. Um, but I did write a framework around of, of text to it. So that was about the American songbook. So. But yeah, I like, I like the acting lark. I mean, it's good fun. Acting, did you just say? Yeah, yeah, it's it's really... It does, you know, it does. It's another discipline, and I really like disciplined formats. You know. Yeah. So that is all of my questions. But all that all that's left to be said now is, Roberts, it's been an absolute pleasure. And you, Ross. And uh, best of luck with everything that you're doing. Thank you, man, and you. Best of luck to Liverpool next season. Thank you. Fulham will be hunting you down. <laughs> oh. But, uh, yeah, anyway. So, yeah, uh, best of luck with everything, and take care. All right, Ross, you take care, mate. All the best. I'll speak to you again, huh? Yeah, definitely. Thanks very much, mate. Good night. Uh, bye.